All right, good afternoon. Um, we're on our way to Friday, which is always a good thing. This morning, the Secretary General took part in a roundtable discussion on women, peace, and security in, peace, in the peacekeeping context. He reiterated that women's full and equal and meaningful participation in achieving sustaining peace is a priority for the UN, as well as the centerpiece of his action plan for peacekeeping initiative. The effectiveness of women's leadership has been particularly evident during the pandemic, Mr. Guterres added, yet women are under siege, bearing disproportionate care and economic burdens, and facing an alarming surge of violence in the home. Mr. Guterres pointed out that the situation of conflict, it is often women who are brokering peace at the community level. However, he added that they continue to be actively sidelined once these processes move to the national and international levels. This must change, he said. Secretary General called on governments, the UN system, regional organizations, civil society, and the wider international community to take bold actions to translate commitments into reality. We must prioritize women's leadership, he said, invest in community-based networks as equal partners, and must adopt feminist approaches to accelerate uh, women's full and equal meaningful participation. Today's women leadership is a cause. Tomorrow, it must be a norm. This, the, his opening remarks will be available as soon as uh, on web TV, on video, uh, early this afternoon. And I know I've been asked by a number of you about uh, the situation in Kyrgyzstan, and I can tell you that we continue to be very concerned about the situation in the Kyrgyz Republic. The special representative for the Secretary General for Central Asia, Natalia German, has been following the situation very closely and is in touch with senior Kyrgyzstani officials to explore ways in which the United Nations can assist the country in finding a peaceful resolution to the current situation. The resident coordinator is also in touch with the authorities in Bishkek. And until a negotiated solution is reached, we urge Kyrgyzstanis to uphold the rule of law in the country and continue to exercise restraint and refrain from violence. Martin Griffiths, uh, the UN Special Envoy for Yemen, says he's following with deep concern the recent military escalations in Hudaydah Governorate and the reports of a number of casualties among civilian population, that includes women and children. He said that the military escalation not only constitutes violations of the Hudaydah ceasefire agreement, but it runs against the spirit of the ongoing UN-facilitated negotiations that aim to achieve a nationwide ceasefire, humanitarian and economic measures to and the resumption of the political process. Mr. Griffith calls on the sides to immediately stop. <coughs> <Excuse> <me>. Mr. Griffiths called on the sides to immediately stop the fighting, respect the commitments they made under the Stockholm Agreement, and engage with the UN missions, uh, the UN mission in Hudaydah's joint implementation mechanisms. Turning to Syria, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs tells us that the Syria Humanitarian Fund has released $40 million to its largest, its largest ever allocation to enable life-saving assistance to 1.3 million people across the country. This includes support to families in underserved areas where humanitarian needs are particularly acute and worsening under the added strain of COVID-19. Announcing the record release from the Humanitarian Fund yesterday, the UN Resident Coordinator and Humanitarian Coordinator for Syria, Imran Riza, said the $40 million allocation will bolster health care systems, augment food security and livelihood opportunities, and enhance the importance of important protection services. Since its creation in 2014, the fund has supported 65 UN humanitarian organizations in Syria. And this morning in the Security Council, the head of the peacekeeping mission in Mali, uh, Mahatma Saleh Anadif, said that peace is close at hand, but the ball remains in the court of the Malian people. Uh, with the, forma uh, the Malians, uh, the formation of the government, with the formation of the government, the lifting of sanctions, Mr. Anadif said he hoped for a rapid reestablish rapid establishment of the National Transitional Council, which will be the country's legislative body. He added that the organization of credible elections that can lead to a return to constitutional order will be based upon political, institutional, electoral, and administrative reforms as set out in the transition charter. From this point of view, he said, the transition con constitutes an opportunity for Malians to get out of an infernal cycle punctuated by a succession of periodic coups. He reiterated the UN's commitment to work with Malians and emphasized the importance of seizing this opportunity to end the crisis in the country and to support the important phase in coordination with the international community, in particular the African Union, 
and the economic community of West African states. And in a tweet earlier today, Mr. Anadif uh, welcomed the release of Bubu Sise, as well as other officials detained since August, describing this as another positive gesture towards a successful and peaceful transition. And a couple of COVID-related notes. An update from Brazil um, on what we're doing there to address the pandemic. The UN team, led by the resident coordinator, Nikki Fabianic, uh, continues to work with the authorities to flatten the curve and live, lift livelihoods. Near Brazil's border with Venezuela, the International Organization for Migration is providing mobile health units for indigenous people and refugees, and together with the UN Refugee Agency, is offering hundreds of free medical consultations every week. Also in the Amazon, the UN Children's Fund delivered 200,000 medical protective and cleaning items to frontline health workers, serving 80,000 indigenous people in more than 700 villages. UNICEF has also provided 15,000 uh, Venezuelan migrants with cash and food, and for its part, the UN Population Fund helped governments and civil society to compile a reliable data and impact of COVID-19 on maternal health, highlighting the need for uninterrupted services for women of all ages. And UN Women is working on a campaign to prevent violence against women, while also involving women in decision-making for the COVID-19 response. And uh, UN AIDS, um, the joint UN uh, program on HIV AIDS, issued new guidance today on how to reduce stigma and discrimination in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. The guidance is based on the latest evidence of what uh, works to reduce HIV-related stigma and discrimination and applies it to COVID-19. UN AIDS notes that since the start of the pandemic, numerous forms of stigma and discrimination have been reported. This includes xenophobia directed at people thought to be responsible for bringing COVID-19 into countries, attacks on healthcare workers, verbal and physical abuse towards people who've recovered from COVID-19. According to UN AIDS, as with the, uh, with the HIV epidemic, stigma and discrimination can significantly undermine the response. And a quick note on the Caribbean, where our humanitarian colleagues tell us they're bolstering their presence in the region during the hurricane season. OCHA has now established a humanitarian advisory team in Barbados that adds teams already in place in Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, as well as a country office in Haiti. The new advisory team will play a key role in strengthening the response capacity in 10 countries and territories under the coverage of the resident coordinator's office in Barbados and the uh, Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. The team will also provide um, support for national disaster management organizations, facilitate rapid resource mobilization, and promote information sharing between partners. And I want to flag a report by, joint report by UNICEF, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, and the UN's economic, uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs on stillbirths, which says that nearly two million babies are, are stillborn every year, or one every second. And that's the, according to the first ever stillbirth estimate uh, that's included in the report. In 2019, three in four stillbirths occurred in sub-Saharan Africa or Southern Asia. The new report warns that COVID-19 pandemic could worsen the global number of stillbirths at 50 um, percent, uh, excuse me, a 50 percent reduction in health services due to the pandemic could cause nearly 200,000 additional stillbirths over a 12 months period in 117 low and middle income countries. More online. And as you know, this is Space Week, so I want to flag that tomorrow the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs, based in Vienna, is organizing a webinar on KiboCube program to mark uh, the Space Week. KiboCube is program is a collaboration with the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency and gives developing countries the opportunity to deploy a satellite from Japanese module of the International Space Station free of cost. Kenya and Guatemala have already deployed their first satellites into orbit through KiboCube, building their space technology skills and gaining access to data and imagery. In the webinar, past and current winners of KiboCube will discuss how the program has helped them uh, access uh, to space exploration. Other winners, such as Mauritius, Indonesia, and Moldova, are set to deploy their satellites through KiboCube in the coming months and years and year. And lastly, the, our friends in Rome at the Food and Agriculture Organization Today said the food price index rose 2.1 percent in September, and five percent, and that and is five percent higher than its value in September of 2019. The increase was led by vegetable oils and cereal, 
FAO cereal price, in, cereal price index rose 5.1% from August and is now 13.6% higher than last year, than a year ago. FAO vegetable price index it rose 6% in September, hitting a new uh, eight-month high as quotations for palm, sunflower, seed, and soy oils all rose in step with firm global demand. Speaking of global demand, Mr. Bayes. Okay, I have two um, questions on different subjects. The authorities in northern Cyprus have reopened part of the seafront in Varosha. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, the Secretary General had spoken about this before it happened, but it's now happened. And in the light of the fact there's a Security Council meeting on this Friday afternoon, can we please have the, the Secretary General's comment? Well, Secretary General's comment uh, is, is, remains the same, that our uh, view and our uh, position is guided uh, by Resolution 550, which says that, con that considers any attempt to settle any part of Varosha by people other than its inhabitants as inadmissible. So you condemn it? I think we've, we've stated our position, which is uh, guided by Security Council resolution. Okay. Other question is about the High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo mm -hmm. Grande. He has contracted COVID-19, mm -hmm. he says, on Twitter. Do you have any details of where he contracted it? I know he was recently in Syria. And what um, contra contact tracing is now underway? Sure. Uh, I know our, uh, our colleagues at UNHCR are very much uh, on top of it. Um, after being tested, he, he and, um, are following, he's following all medical uh, procedures and guidelines, uh, following the guidelines not only of WHO, but the Swiss, Swiss authorities, as he is based in Switzerland. Uh, in total, seven other people who were in close contact with the High Commissioner on Monday are now self-isolating for 14 days, watching for any symptoms. So far, as of yesterday, no one had developed any symptoms. Um, over the, you know, over the past two weeks, as you know, he's been, uh, as you know, he's been uh, moving around. And according to the medical protocols, 48 hours from the time of the symptoms are the period to be considered for tracing. So UNHCR is following this established protocol, and in close contacts were informed about the High Commissioner's uh, situation. Um, and in the past two weeks, uh, he's been in Geneva and traveled to Brussels, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. And I would add that uh, the Secretary General has obviously wishes him well, as we, I'm sure, all do. I mean, as I know we all do. <laughs> all right, Edie, and then we'll go to the screens. Uh, thank you, Steph. Um, it appears that there's a stalemate over the Secretary General's uh, latest candidate to be the new uh, SRSG for Libya. And I, we heard this from several ambassadors today. Um, does the Secretary General plan to nominate another uh, candidate to be the special representative uh, post that's been open since March. Yes, very much so. I mean, we, uh, you know, obviously the, the mission currently has very strong leadership from Stephanie Williams. I mean, you, you, she led the, uh, she participated in the meeting of the Berlin, uh, the, the meeting we just had, uh, the meeting we just had here, I mean, virtually here, uh, she spoke to you. Um, she's clearly uh, leading the mission. Of course, uh, the Secretary General will nominate a, someone uh, to take up the, that role, as well as the role of uh, special um, envoy, as well as the, the role of coordinator, as outlined in the Security Council resolution. Th those, you know, it, it's, it's not a secret that uh, the process has not been an easy one. If it had been easy, we would have uh, found a replacement um, for Mr. Salome quite a while ago, uh, and the Secretary General and others are involved in discussions, and as soon as we have um, a clearer path forward, um, there will be an announcement. And how soon do you expect these new candidates to be announced? I mean, in the, I mean I, even, uh, even to the uh, Security, Security Council, not to I, us. I, uh, 
As I said, this has not been an easy process, uh, and so I will uh, hold back on making any prediction or putting any money down anywhere. James, and then we'll go to Carla. Yeah. On, on that, because your answer to Edie's first question was yes. Um, when she said, is he going to put forward, nominate another candidate? He has informally, I understand, nominated Mr Mladenov. Um, we know that there is objection to Mr Mladenov. Um, Edie and I were just told by the South African ambassador, Mr Mladenov is doing an excellent job in the Middle East. He should stay there. Um, could you just... Because I didn't really understand whether you meant Mr Mladenov no, no, is, now, I, I, let, is let, now no, no longer no, no, a candidate no, 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 and he's no, no, nominating let's, someone let's, else because I know be, he's not formally been right, nominated. Let, let's, let's, let's be clear. I, from this podium, I will... And I don't think I ever have speculated about who may be in, you know, who, which horse may be in the lead, what's going on informally. Uh, I'm talking about the formal nomination uh, process. I won't comment on uh, the speculations, based or unbased, that have been going on in the corridors. Yes, Carla. Thank you. Oh, sorry, and I, I keep forgetting we have people on the screen, but go ahead. Um, there was recently a huge article in the New York Times science section about the fact that the scarce resources that are available in many of the Asian, African, and Latin American countries have medical re, um, treatments have been diverted to treating COVID-19. And so tuberculosis, AIDS, and malaria are resurging in huge numbers. And because of the quarantine, um, the people are unable to get to the medical facilities um, to get sufficient medication to take it as it needs to be taken. And so resistance strains of these horrible diseases are developing. So how is the UN planning I mean, to address this? That's, uh, that's a fact. It's something we've been highlighting for quite some time, which is one of, yeah. one of the many side impacts of the lockdown is lack of access uh, to regular health care. And it's true for just about every country, um, especially when, you know, schools... Uh, were a big uh, place where, people, where children were immunized. So I know our colleagues at World Health Organization and UNICEF are trying by whatever means they can to overcome uh, this situation to ensure that there is not a growing gap in the needs of, of people being immunized. Uh, Mr. Abdel Hamid, Hamid Sayam, welcome. Thank you. I just want to comment on what Mr. Bay said about the excellent job um, Radinov is doing in the Middle East. I wonder what kind well, of I'm, I, uh, Abdel Hamid, I'm, I'm all, always glad question. to be. I'm always glad to be part to be a observer in discussions yeah. journalists have amongst okay. themselves. But so if you have something question, with a question mark at the end, fire away. It, no, I I have a question. I have a question. <laughs> drawing the lessons from Nagorno-Karabakh because freezing the conflict does not mean it is done. It will come back and it will come back again. There are few resolutions on, uh, by the Security Council in 1948 and 49 and 50 on Kashmir, similar to those resolutions in 1993 on Nagorno-Karabakh. Why the Secretary General does not play a more a a proactive role and explore the situation, what can be done. The situation in Kashmir cannot, is not sustainable. 950,000 troops are in the uh, enclave. There are uh, completely, the uh, Kashmir is cut off from the rest of the world. Oppression is reaching all time high, and yet there is no movement toward addressing that conflict. What could be done? I mean, uh, you know, in terms of frozen, in terms of and conflicts, there are, many, there are a number around the world, um, and it is not for lack of trying from this Secretary General and his, his predecessors as trying to uh, pick at the ice, uh, so to speak. Uh, right now, we're seeing uh, a conflict uh, that is anything but frozen, but is very hot and active, unfortunately, in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict uh, zone. Um, We've seen the, you know, we know, very well know that uh, there will be a meeting um, in Geneva and in Moscow uh, with the co-chairs of the OC uh, Minsk uh, group. Uh, we encourage yet again uh, all sides to work closely with them to achieve a ceasefire immediately and create an, a return to, to negotiations. There is, in this particular conflict, there is a, a mechanism 
uh, and we want the sites to re-engage with this mechanism. Okay, um, I think that's it, unless somebody waves their hands in the air. Yes, Ray, please. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, talking about the U.S. elections, in case Mr. Biden uh, wins this election and there will be no smooth uh, transition um, and the, uh, Mr. Trump will refuse to leave the office, will the U.N. Uh, get involved to assure a smooth transition in this case? I, I don't like to speculate, and I really am not going to speculate in this case. Uh, Carla, quick question if you... Wish. Any possibility, since there is a dearth of resources for dealing with the COVID-19 globally, is there any possibility of some suggestion of a diminution of money and resources spent on the military and diverting it toward medical needs? That's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, um, that is... Um, that is something, um, hold on a second, I'm sorry. Uh, um, that is something that is sadly uh, out of, um, whatever, sadly or not, but that is firmly out of the hands of the Secretary General, and I think he's often spoken, uh, and many parts of the UN spoken about the, the over-expenditure that we're seeing in military mm -hmm. budgets. Okay, thank you all. Hasta mañana. <laughs>